You're listening to an archived Cabral Concept podcast. After listening to this show, check out the most up-to-date podcasts available at stephencabral.com slash podcasts or search directly on iTunes. And now, welcome to the Cabral Concept, where board-certified naturopath and integrative health practitioner Dr. Stephen Cabral shares how he was diagnosed at the age of 17 with a life-altering illness and given no hope for recovery. It was only after studying and traveling all over the world did he discover how to combine ancient Ayurvedic healing practices with state-of-the-art naturopathic and functional medicine to fully rebalance the body and re-energize it with life. It's time to discover how to get well, lose weight, and finally feel alive again. And now, here's your host, Dr. Stephen Cabral. So happy you could join me here today on this Total Wellness Tuesday show, where I want to go over the three so-called unhealthy foods that I believe almost everyone should be eating. And the reason why I like bringing up topics like this is to have a little fun, but also to show you that when we go too far on one side of the diet equation or exercise equation or any part of of life that you know a lot of the gurus and experts bring us is that we lose and much to the detriment of our health a lot of the foods a lot of the exercise a lot of the lifestyle a lot of things that we should be doing in life that actually keep us healthy in the long run because here's the thing here's the tricky part that most of us can lose the weight by going low carb for a short period of time or most of us can lose weight by doing any specific fad type diet but what happens in the long run Well, what happens in the long run is we get set up for a lifetime of a lowered metabolism or imbalanced hormones or some type of potential dis-ease in the body. What I want to do today is I want to show you that you can include a lot of the foods that people are telling you not to eat, not because they're not healthy, but they're worried for you because they don't fit within their certain dogma. And that's the problem is that we have to stop being so limited in what we believe. Like, for example... If you're paleo, okay, so you eat predominantly paleo-based foods, and that means you can have your, you know, certain fruits and certain proteins, those types of things, but you can't touch grains. So all of a sudden, every single grain, not just gluten or not just wheat or any of those things, but all grains together are bad for you, right? Because you're following a paleo-based diet. And then if you're doing keto, well, you have to be careful. Don't go over that four to one ratio or don't go over that, you know, 50 grams of carbs per day because that will kick you out of ketosis. Well, that would limit you then to the amount of actual fruits and vegetables or just vegetables in general that you could eat. Same thing for going too low carb for too long. Well, what happens? Yes, we do the same thing in my practice. We can help people lose weight. We can initiate them into part of our protocol by doing that. But what happens when you go too long on low carb? Well, what happens is you can start to then become very desensitized or unsensitive to being able to put carbohydrates back in your body. And at the same time, our body, the signals from leptin and ghrelin that tell us we're full or not full, satiated or not, can be thrown off. And also, we can also start to move into a lowered metabolic state. That can include thyroid hormones. It can include increased adrenal-based or cortisol-based hormones. So we can look at all these things and we can test them. So anyone says, that's not true, or this is true, whatever it is, to me, it's kind of a moot point. We can just say, does it affect you? Yes or no, because you could run a thyroid adrenal hormone test, oftentimes called the weight loss test or the metabolic test. And that's because you get to look at your vitamin D levels. You get to look at your adrenal levels, meaning cortisol at four times throughout the day, your testosterone, your DHEA, your progesterone, your estrogen, your thyroid, meaning your TSH, T4, T3, and TPO antibodies. And you also get to look at your blood sugar numbers. So again, when we're talking about your body, your bioindividuality, all of those things can be tested. And that's why I'm such a huge proponent of functional medicine testing. And again, you can see all the tests that we recommend. We always put them up. And today's show notes will be at stephencabral.com forward slash 886. So if you ever want to see the recommendations for that thyroid adrenal hormone test or a hair tissue mineral analysis or any of these types of labs, you can simply go to stephencabral.com forward slash 886 for today's show notes. Now, let's get right into the show. And the reason is that I kind of set you up. I think you already know, maybe, if you've been listening on previous podcasts, what I have in store for you in terms of kind of going against the grain, no pun intended, but really going after a lot of these diets that are so, they're so restrictive, meaning that you can never have grains and you can never have any nightshades and you can never have any of these things. Well, The truth is that, and I've explained this to a lot of friends and colleagues that I work with, and a lot of these are nutritionists themselves, 
or they do advanced nutritional studies and they ask me like, hey, what's your opinion on the, the lectin diet? And I just say, well, hey, here's a podcast I did on the high lectin diet. And I was called, should you be following a low lectin diet? So check out that show if you want to get my viewpoint on lectins. And again, you can just go to stephencabral.com forward slash podcasts and literally type in lectin, L-E-C-T-I-N, and you'll be able to see my thoughts on lectins. But again, I give it to you from an unbiased perspective. I don't care if lectins are good or bad. It does not matter to me. Like I hold no food in the highest regard. I hold no diet in the highest regard because I studied deep into Ayurvedic medicine, traditional Chinese medicine. I studied advanced bioindividuality and bioregulatory medicine. So I understand that there's no one diet. There's no one food for any individual. So I can't get too caught up in what's the best food because there is no best food. Now, again, I did another show, The Foundation of All Diets. I hope that you check out that show because there is a foundation, meaning like there is an actual template that you should be following. Same thing for nightshades. If you want to figure out my thoughts on nightshades, just go to stephencabral.com forward slash podcast and type in nightshades or deadly inflammatory food that it's referred to as. So check that out right now. I want to get right into the show because I really... These are three foods. I mean, these are three foods literally every day in my diet that I'm eating. And I just feel that people are missing out tremendously on these health benefits if they're following a keto-based diet, if they're following a strict paleo-based diet, or if they're following any type of low-carb diet for too long. I'm going to give you my picks for each one, but I'm also going to give you those three foods and then allow you to make your own decision. So that's a whole thing about the Cabral concept. I do not want to make your decision for you. I want you to listen to the data. I'm going to explain it from many different viewpoints so that you get to choose where you're at right now in your life. Does it make sense? Yes or no. And that's it. So again, like there's no good, there's no bad, there's no he's right, she's right. It's none of that. It's not about that. It's about understanding what's right for you in this current moment. And in Ayurveda, we call that the Vakriti. We call that the now, the present, the you, which is your phenotype of what you become right now. And then we also have to look at the Prakriti, which is your genotype. It's you in the long run. It's you for longevity. We want to look at both of those specific things. All right. So I want to get right into it. And again, I'm going to link up these articles because there were two great articles that were written. The first one, I mean, honestly, it's like my kryptonite is trying to pronounce people's names unless it's like your typical like Sally or Bob or Steven. You know, it's like, Unless it's that, it's I've the most challenging time. But this is H-R-E-F-N-A. So we're going to call, I'm going to just pretend the H is silent and just go with Refna. And the last name is Paul's Dotter. So I'm going to link that up today. Great little article, a lot of science behind it. I, so again, even though I literally studied the best of Eastern medicine, I am truly like, I am truly science-based at heart because I want to know, here's the bottom line is that in my practice, a lot of people come to me and they just say, hey, you're my last stop, you're my last resort, my last hope, any of those things. I'm not doing it if this doesn't work. And I understand that. I was there myself. I've been there many times. I don't want you to say that. I don't want you to think that. But I want you to do is I want you to understand that if you order a lab test through Equilibrium Nutrition, I read over all your results. We're going to get you the best plan for you. If you work on a private practice, any one of those things, I take my teaching very, very serious. And I want you to know that all of it is based in science. But not only is it based in modern day science, state of the art functional medicine, it's also making sure that it makes sense from a previous Ayurvedic and all of the Eastern based philosophies as well. It has to pass both of those, in my opinion, because like I showed you last Friday, a lot of the medical research is wrong. So when a friend says to you, like, oh, science proved that this didn't work, I'm like, okay, show me the study show me multiple studies, show me that it wasn't done on just 12 people, right? And then let's go from there. Because I went through that, I actually walked you through that last Friday and just showed you really bad medical science. I mean, honestly, just not good. And that's why you'd be very, very careful. I don't care if it was written in the Wall Street Journal or you know the Washington Post or anything. If it's bad science, it's just bad science. That's the bottom line. So I need to make sure that it makes sense from all different perspectives. All right, without further ado, let's get right into it. The first so-called unhealthy food that I believe most people, not all people, but most people should be eating are oats, okay? Gluten-free oats, not gluten-based oats, but gluten-free oats. Now, oats by nature are essentially gluten-free or should be gluten-free. They can be cross-contaminated on a 
conveyor belt or in a facility that processes gluten-based foods. But oats by themselves should be gluten-free. Now, I'm going to give you my pick at the end, but what I want to go through is this. is like, why am I saying that oats are a health food that a lot of people are saying unhealthy? Why? Because oats are a grain, so they're saying they're unhealthy because they're a grain. And they're also saying they're unhealthy because they're a higher carbohydrate-based food. And that they're going to spike blood sugar levels. They're going to do all these different things. Well, let's take a look at that. Let's see if the science actually backs that up. Or if oats are just being lumped into the, you know, the wheat, the gluten, the processed food-based varieties. Okay. So what I like to do is I like to get right into it and, and just talk about the nutrition of foods as well. We're never talking about processed food. The oats I'm talking about are literally whole oats. Okay. They could be stale cut. They could be ground oats, but it's going to be from a whole oat variety, ideally organic and ideally gluten-free. But when I look at it, I look at the nutrition from oats and I'm looking at literally, when I look at, you know, what does the body need to take in? So again, I like using the daily nutritional support powder or the daily activated multi as kind of my fail safe. It's the way that I get all my multivitamins and all my minerals all in there. But I get that. I make sure that I try to get it from food. So again, the nutritional supplements are from my feel safe. It's make sure I get everything I need every day. But then I try to get it from my food. And oats contain literally 34% of the magnesium. Now, that's just a minimum, but it's still 34%. 41% of your phosphorus for the day. 191% of your manganese for the day, 20% of your iron, 20% of your zinc, which is incredible, 11% of your folate, also known as folic acid, 39% of your vitamin B1, and 10% of your vitamin B5. Hopefully you tuned into last Friday review, last Friday's podcast, where we talked about that vitamin B5 and why it's so essential for you. So really, really impressive. Copper as well, 24%. So really a powerhouse. One of the big things I like to talk about oats as well is that in one cup cooked, you're essentially getting only five grams of fat, but you're getting eight grams of fiber. That's incredible. Eight grams of fiber. That's hard to match in one cup of one other type of a carbohydrate as well. So really, really impressive. Another big thing is that oats contain very special antioxidants. I've actually talked about oats on their own podcast before on a Friday review. But oats contain some very anti-inflammatory antioxidants that a lot of people don't know about. And the reason why they don't know about these anti-inflammatory antioxidants are that oats are basically a white color. And most white foods or brown foods aren't massive powerhouses of antioxidants. They're not. Antioxidants are usually contained in more of the colorful foods. You can see them. Like those antioxidants or anthocyanins, which we're going to talk about in a moment, are not in oats. They're different. They're called... And again, I might be mispronouncing this, but I still want to give you the data and information first. Avenothiamides, uh, and I'm definitely mispronouncing that, but also ferulic acid, which is pronounced correctly. And these are very powerful anti-inflammatories, so powerful that we use oats in my practice a lot of time just as a temporary. This is temporary not to heal, and again, I use that in air quotes, eczema and psoriasis, but it helps take the itch out. So you can actually apply oats topically as well from a natural health perspective. But obviously, we like to do them internally. Why do we like to use them internally as well? Well, a lot of people were using this for blood pressure-based issue, cardiovascular-based issues, because oats help to produce more nitric oxide. So they actually help to increase blood flow and dilate blood vessels. So great for energy, great for blood flow, great as an anti-inflammatory. And they're fantastic for the cholesterol, for help balancing healthy cholesterol in the body and healthy LDL, which are bad cholesterol levels. So again, I've talked about oats in the past. I gave you specific Harvard University-based studies of how they're able to lower cholesterol by themselves, somewhere between 8 and 16%, just by adding in oats on a daily basis. And that's with serum cholesterol levels, meaning in your blood. But also, they contain a large amount of what's called beta-glucan. Beta-glucan, great for cholesterol, but also fantastic for the immune system as well. So really, really potent in terms of overall, again, we talked about it like, What's the number one killer of all adults in the United States? Heart disease, right? And that includes inflammation of the arteries as well as cholesterol-based numbers. Now, if we look at that and we say oats can help with that, wouldn't that make sense to potentially add oats into our diet since they're probably the number one starch or number one particular grain or product in general to help with cholesterol? I would say yes. All right. Another big thing is we say, well, we don't eat oats because we're worried about blood sugar-based issues. Interesting, right? Because I have here a bunch of studies that show that 
oats may help lower blood sugar blood sugar levels, especially in people who are overweight and prone to or have type 2 diabetes. Because as we know, type 2 diabetes is much more common, meaning at least 9 out of 10 of those people being overweight or a higher BMI-based level. So I'm going to link this up in the show notes today. But again, if all you're reading is like, stay away from carbs, stay away from carbs, like you have to understand that sure, in the short term, we go on a lower carb diet as well. But after three weeks, we're beginning to ramp that back up. Whether you're following our Candida and Vectoral Overgrowth Protocol, whether you're following our weight loss plan, whatever it might be, the Dr. Ball Detox, same thing. We're adding it back in. Really, really important. Plus, big thing with oats is satiation. I talked about this a little bit in the beginning. It's about leptin. It's about ghrelin. If you've never heard of those things before, go to stephencabral.com forward slash podcast and type in leptin, L-E-P-T-I-N, and you will find that podcast on those two satiation-based hormones that you have to understand not only do they pause satiation, but if you're satiated and your body gets the right chemical-based signals, you'll begin to burn more body fat. So yes, sometimes you have to actually eat some carbs to feel satiated. Your body doesn't think that it's starving. It's not a starvation-based mode. This goes especially for women. After six weeks, I see in my clinical practice, and again, clinical practice means that we get to see what's really working in the real world. And a lot of women's thyroid numbers begin to drop, not in a good way, after six weeks of a very low-carb or keto-based diet. Something to take into consideration, again, the thyroid adrenal hormone test will actually show you where you're at. All right, we talked about a little bit about skincare, how we use that topically, but again, that's not my biggest concern with oats. Another big one is this, is that since oats are an anti-inflammatory, they seem to work phenomenally well with asthma and allergies in, in children. Okay, I'm gonna link up five studies today. They're all in this one article. It's a great article. And again, I like to share the love with all these great scientists and health practitioners and dietitians who are writing these articles and pulling all the research together. Because in my job as a teacher and as a clinician, as a functional medicine practitioner, as a naturopathic doctor, I am using all of this great research in my practice. And that's how I develop all these protocols based on thousands and thousands of books that I read and thousands, probably over 10,000 studies that I've combed through as well. Just a few other things, and we'll keep it at that. But I would just say, if a lot of people I work with are suffering from constipation, right? Or they're suffering from either alternating constipation or loose stool. Oats seem to work great as a bulk fiber and help to regulate that peristaltic movement. So I'm a big fan of adding oats in. They help to relieve constipation and really add a lot more bulk to the stool. So these are all amazing benefits of oats. Again, I told you what I recommend, but right now I'm leaning towards the Bob's Red Mill. They're organic, they're gluten-free, you can get the oat grouts, still cut oats, or just in general, gluten-free organic oats are great. Now, again, there are many great brands. There's a lot of smaller companies as well. They can all be fantastic. Honestly, just look for organic, look for gluten-free. If you can get local, get local. I mean, that that's just a great way, great way to go in general. And so again, if you're looking to lose weight, I just recommend the 21-day Dr. Cabral Detox. After that, again, I start to add in some more fruit. We'll talk about that in a moment. And then if possible, we start to add in more oats. We simply look at how carbohydrate sensitive the body is. And again, if you do this slowly, you'll realize that after 12 to 16 weeks, the body is less carbo sensitive. You're able to add more back in because the cell membranes actually begin to change. I can't go over that today. I've talked about that in a previous Cabral concept. Hopefully, you're able to go back and listen to previous podcasts if you are a new listener, but I talk about cell membrane dynamics and how a lot of times people with these uh, blood sugar-based issues, it's a cell membrane issue, not actually a food-based issue, right? Because your body is producing the insulin. We look at that. Again, we can see that on a thyroid adrenal hormone test, but you can't get that sugar into the cells. Your body produces massive amounts of insulin. What you need to do at that point, you can also run an omega-3 test to see if you're just super saturated with omega-6s in the cells. That's a problem. Check that out as well. All right. Number two is this fruit. I cannot believe right now, like this is honestly, let's say you want to get rid of oats. Okay. I can be on this on board with that. What I could never get on board with again, I can never get on board with not having any fruit in your diet is completely insane to me. Like literally completely insane to me. People on keto based diets, carnivore based diets, and even a lot of paleo based diets that are doing less fruit to not 
eat fruit, and even lectin-based diets. Again, I talk about that on my podcast on lectins. Please go back and check out that show because even Dr. Gundry would agree with me. I know he would. I know that he would. That it's meant to be a temporary short-term diet while you heal and seal your gut. You have to, I mean, it's so important that a lot of these foods people can't eat is because they have gut issues. Run an organic acids test. Run a stool test. Look for the candida overgrowth. Look for the bacterial overgrowth. Look for the H. pylori. Look for the parasites. When you find them, now you know why you can't eat all these different foods because your microbiome isn't balanced. It doesn't have to do with all these genetic-based predispositions that you think you may have. They play into it, but only when the microbiome, inflammation, vitamin deficiencies are present. You get rid of those, your genetics begin to quiet, right? We call that epigenetics, quieting of our genotype. Okay, really, really important. So here's the deal. I want to give you a little bit of science on the berries, but not as much as I just did with the oats, because I think a lot of people understand from my previous podcast that fruit and vegetables, not just vegetables, but fruit and vegetables, I want to explain why, hold the key to staving off cancer and a lot of other diseases. And the reason I can say that with great ease is it is that, it's, well, one, it's clinically proven, so that's easy. But number two is this, is that berries are an easy way to get a rainbow of colors in our diet. You honestly, if you, so there's science, which is super important, right? I told, just told you that I'm a science first, basically guy. It has to be backed by science, but then it also has to, it has to pass the common sense rule. Do you really think eating meat as a human, just meat, with a 28 foot intestinal tract is what humans were meant to do? When every other carnivore in the world has about six foot or less essentially essential, uh, intestinal tract, why? So they can get the meat out of their system quickly so that it doesn't begin to putrefy. And they have a lot of stomach acid, a much lower pH than we have. Can we eat some meat? Sure. I'm not saying that. If you're vegan, great. I have no problem with that either. Like, it's all good. It is all good. Where we go overboard is thinking that we're supposed to be one thing. But I can tell you for sure, we're not meant to eat straight meat. Now you can say, well, I cured this, this, and this by eating straight meat. No, you didn't. You got rid of your symptoms. You did not cure it. I was just listening to a podcast and a brilliant, a brilliant psychologist was on the show that I know I could very easily help with his health issues. The problem is that they've been led to believe that by eliminating fruits and vegetables that they've healed their issue. They haven't. What they've done is basically play peekaboo with their underlying inflammation and dis-ease in the body. The reason is by not eating vegetables, by not eating fruit, they're not aggravating their microbiome because they're not feeding the bacterial overgrowth, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. They're not feeding any candida. They're not feeding any imbalance that is there currently because meat does not do that. The problem is that that does not fix the body. It does not heal the underlying root causes. It simply eliminates the symptoms. Those symptoms will fester. They will eventually become even worse. It's so important to understand that. All right, I'm, I don't even know how I got onto that tangent. But here's the deal. With vegetables, you want to get a rainbow as well. You want to get an absolute rainbow in vegetables. But it's so easy to do that, especially with berries. So berries are my number two. Fruit in general, I believe that most people should be getting at least two cups per day, if not three or more, and especially berries. Here's why. They're one of the most powerful antioxidants and squelchers of free radicals in the body. It is these free radicals that destroy cells, that create cell destruction, that cause inflammation. Inflammation in the arteries, which can lead to cardiovascular disease, the lungs for pulmonary issues, on the nerves or the nerve endings or around the myelin sheath, which leads to nervous system-based issues, in the brain, which can lead to dementia, Alzheimer's, any type of deterioration of the body. And antioxidants, especially organic and local, are going to be what staves off those types of diseases. We cannot replace those. Again, what do I use? I use my daily fruit and vegetable blend on a daily basis to get a rainbow of colors, not just greens, but it's reds and greens and it's a rainbow of colors. But I would never replace my two to four cups of berries or fruit every day. And again, I'm saying berries because most people, even with blood sugar-based issues, would do really well with eating berries. And again, all these people worried about the glycemic response, more scientific studies that show this. Test tube and human studies suggest that they may protect, meaning berries may protect you 
from high blood sugar levels and help with insulin sensitivities while reducing blood sugar as a response to high carb meals. That means actual berries. Like if you ate berries before a meal, that would actually help you not to spike blood sugar at a meal. And again, I've talked about this before. Adding a sugary drink, just by adding blueberries to that, would actually lower your glycemic response, even though you added more sugar. But here's the deal. It's because sugar is not sugar. People lump fruit into the sugar. They just say, well, it's all sugar. It's not. It is not all sugar. You have to understand that. The body does not metabolize it all in the same way. And I go through this. It showed this in type 2 diabetics. It showed this in insulin-resistant people. I mean, really amazing. I'll link this up for you as well. But the reason is this. Besides the powerful antioxidant effects, all right, the anthocyanins, they're called, cyanines, is that berries are also extremely high in fiber. And so they, again, make you more satiated. But here's the deal. With just 15 grams of carbs for most berries, think about it, blueberries, blackberries, raspberries, somewhere between 15 and 20 grams, okay? They contain about half that in fiber, especially raspberries and blackberries, because it's predominantly skin. The more skin you eat on those vegetables, think about, sorry, on those fruit, the more antioxidants you're getting. And it's because the skin acts as the antioxidant layer predominantly. Now, let me make that, explain that easier. What is inside of that vegetable or fruit will oxidize when cut. And the reason it oxidizes from the oxygen is because its outer shell or skin has been cut, right? And it's that outer shell that has been preventing it from oxidizing. It's an antioxidant. So when we eat these antioxidants, namely the skins, we get those same antioxidant-based benefits. And the different colors actually provide different benefits. So absolutely important. Like really, This is extremely important. You get the vitamins, you get all the vitamins, you get all the minerals. I'm not going to go through all of those right now, but extremely, extremely important. Again, especially if you're dealing with inflammatory-based issues, high levels of CRP, high levels of interleukin-6, high levels of cardiovascular-based issues, joint pain, increase your berry intake. High cholesterol, same thing. I'm genetically predisposed to high cholesterol. That does not mean I have to have high cholesterol just because... Both of my parents and all my grandparents had that. I had high cholesterol at 17 years old. I had high homocysteine at 17 years old. I had high CRP at 17 years old. I do not have those today. And the reason I don't is I have to, I watch what I eat. I know it works for my body and I increase all of those antioxidants. So very, very important. But berries also help to promote a better aging. So less wrinkles of the skin, better collagen production, It's because they have high levels of vitamin C as well, and they help to promote an anti-cancer-based environment in your body with the elegic acid, the resveratrol, all of those amazing things. Super, super important. Again, I believe they can be had on every single diet. All right, the last food today. And again, so what's my pick? Local organic. If you can get local organic berries, even better. Now, should they be in season? Sure, absolutely. But honestly, I promote berries all year long. And actually, one of the studies talks about putting them in your smoothie. I want to get that for you because this is really, really impressive. I want to read this to you right now. And again, I know I'm going a little bit long here, but in a six-week study of obese, insulin-resistant people who consumed a blueberry smoothie twice per day experienced improvements in insulin sensitivity than the group who consumed smoothies without berries. Can you imagine that? They took in more carbs and more fruit and more sugar coming from those berries, but they had better insulin resistance. They had better glucose levels, and they lost weight. From adding berries, what is my number one smoothie in the morning? Blueberries, spinach, the daily nutritional support powder. Again, you can download these for free by going to any podcast page. So if you were to go to stephencabral.com forward slash 886, you could simply Click on the little photo at the bottom to download our smoothie guide. I am not kidding you when I recommend these things for overall health, for overall body transformation and anti-aging. I keep a huge bag of wild blueberries in my refrigerator every single week. It never runs out. We always have backups. Now, if I have some raspberries, if I have some cherries, I'll throw them in. But I never go without 
those berries. And I always put two cups in my smoothie every morning. Now, again, if you're looking to lose weight, first we do no fruit on the, on the Dr. Wall Detox. Okay. And if we do no fruit on the Dr. Wall Detox, then we add in the blueberries in the smoothie in the morning. It's very tasty. You can make it absolutely delicious. And again, you can add in raspberries and blackberries. You can do whatever you'd like. Add in those berries though. Work your way up to two cups if you're able to. I do two cups every single morning. And sometimes before lunch or usually like mid-afternoon after workout or so, I'll do another cup or two of berries. You don't have to add that much. It depends on how active you are. It depends on your body type, all of those things. But try to get in two cups of berries per day. Local organic, ideally, but get in whatever you can. Frozen organic or frozen wild is fine as well. All right, let's go over the last one. We won't spend as much time on it, but really, really important. And that is this. A lot of people say starch is bad for you. No starch on paleo or, well, some paleo. No starch on keto. No starch on low carb. But here's the deal. Somebody has to stick up for these good foods. And I'm not talking about processed starch. I'm not talking about chips. I'm not talking about bread. I'm not talking about pastas and things like that. I'm not. What I'm talking about are root-based vegetables, starches like sweet potatoes and yuca. And one of my favorites is Japanese yams with the purple skin and the yellow inside. Absolutely delicious. And then things like squash, summer squash, right? Spaghetti squash, acorn squash, all the pumpkin, all the different types of squash, parsnips, rainbow carrots. Why? Again, they contain all of those antioxidants. These are also anti-cancer foods, high levels of vitamin C and vitamin A in the orange-based ones like the sweet potatoes and the squash but you're also getting a very high fiber food, helps with constipation. And I didn't mention this, but they're natural prebiotics. I like to get my prebiotics not from a supplement, but from food. I like to get it from celery and I like to get it from different types of starches, right? That's where I'm getting a lot of my prebiotics for. Again, I'm getting my vitamin A's, my vitamin C's, things that will boost my immune system. Also, again, these starches contain lots of fiber and this fiber, again, helps with blood sugar. Can you overdo starches? Yes, you can. And again, if you look and listen, if you read the rain barrel effect, I gave you the different nutrition plans for whether you're looking to gain weight, maintain your weight, or lose weight. If you're looking to lose weight, first you do, again, something like the Dr. Brawl Detox. And then you begin to add the smoothies in your shake in the morning. If that works, great. Sorry, you're going to add the fruit in your smoothies in your shake in the morning. And then at lunch, you'll try like a half of a sweet potato. And if that works, great. Then you'll increase it a little bit more. Great. And then if it's still working, you're still losing weight, then you can add a little bit at dinner. But if not, you'll do mainly just straight veggies uh, or maybe some of the lower glycemic index ones like parsnips and rainbow carrots. And you can get some beets in there a little bit as well. Again, how much? Well, about a half a cup or so. Start there. Then you might be able to work your way up to a cup. But again, something so high in fiber, antioxidants, help with cholesterol. I'm going to get this episode for you because I want to make sure that you tuned into it. It was episode, let's see right here, Can You Cheat Death, episode 872. If you did not listen to that show, go to stephencabral.com forward slash 872. You will understand that the foods that I'm talking about today will help to prevent 75% of all of the leading causes of death, right? Premature death. And if you don't die from one of those, your, your possibility of living well past the median age of somewhere around 74 to 78 years old is going to be so much greater because you won't have the cardiovascular disease. You won't have the different types of cancer. You won't have the diabetes, right? You won't have those issues of why most people suffer an early death. Plus, not only that, you'll live longer, stronger because I want you to live to a nice, ripe, old age. But at the same time, I don't want you decrepit. I don't want your joints to hurt. I want you to be able to enjoy playing with your grandkids or your community or your church or whatever it might be. You want to enjoy life as you get older. You want to have zest. You want to have vitality. And you will not have that if you've been depriving your body year after year on these insane deprivation-based diets where they do not allow you to have all of these powerful rainbow-based foods. So I'm going to keep it at that for today. I'll link up those two articles that I really enjoyed with all the science behind them. And I just want you to understand that you can start slow with these carbohydrate-based foods, but I want you to know that carbohydrates are not the enemy. It's some type of metabolic-based issue. You have to understand that. Again, the thyroid adrenal hormone test. If these carbs cause bloating, run the organic acids test, run the stool test, find out why they cause bloating. Just don't stay away from them. And remember, 
these feed your microbiome. Humans were meant to just go out in nature and pick berries and pick, pull these root vegetables right out of the ground. You have to understand, like, this is what humans were meant to eat. Like, this is what we were given these hands for, these teeth for, this intestinal tract. Majority of the diet has to be plant based. Remember, look into the nutrition, question everything, question everything, question today's podcast. Do the research. You'll figure it out. You will find out that what I'm telling you today is the truth. It's unbiased and it's what's going to help you live the best wellness, the best body you can have and the best anti-aging based protocol you could possibly follow. That's my promise to you. That is the truth. And I will keep preaching that even if it's not popular. I don't care about a popularity contest. It's about speaking the truth. And hopefully this was helpful. If it was, if this show was helpful today, please do share this message with anyone you believe it could serve. Ever wonder what the best sauna, blue blockers, sleep trackers, wake lights, salt lamps, or other health gadgets are? Or what about the top non-toxic mattresses, sheets, soaps, bath products, toothpaste, and cookware? Or would you like to know the cleanest choices for hemp hearts, meal delivery services, supplements, and much more? I personally curated, researched, and now created a resource page of all of my top picks that continues to grow each week. These are the exact products I use in my own life, with my family, in my private practice, and they're the ones I trust. To find out all of my up-to-date recommendations and all the details, simply head on over to stephencabral.com forward slash resources. 